Hey, it is October the 1st, and we're going to start the month off strong. This is a serious question that many people ponder, wonder about, or seek counsel about. How to be successful in life. People are looking for shortcuts, strategies, magic jelly beans, and other things. And it hit me. What really made me successful and what has made other people successful, like a ton of bricks while I was watching football this weekend. You have those moments. But before we jump into that, if you want to change your mindset, have a better life, make more money, grab a copy of my audiobook, The Hustler's Mindset, Pimping Your Mind for Success. I saw something this weekend that shouldn't have happened. If you were like me watching the Seattle Seahawks play the Tex- the Houston Texans, you would have thought, by the way that game went, that the score would have been totally different. The Seattle Seahawks were literally outplayed, outhustled, just showed up for damn near three quarters. Then something happened. The Seattle Seahawks, and I love the team because I love what they're about. I love the quarterback, Russell Wilson. His attitude is probably one of the best of any quarterback in the NFL. And see, another reason I like his story is he wasn't a first-round draft pick. He wasn't even supposed to be the starter. He earned the job. Understand that. He earned the job. And I was watching the game, and I was just like, wow, well, they're about to be 3-1. and one. And then Russell Wilson starts doing the magic act. There was about three really good plays, and I said, like, they're going to score. And then something else, the, the energy was like, they're going to win. And at this time, the score was 20-3. to three. It was the middle of the third quarter. For those of you who are not football fans, they had roughly 20 minutes left, 15 minutes for the fourth quarter and about four and a half left in the third. So they go ahead and they score. And I'm just like, wow, you know, so it's like, you know, it's very respectable. It's 10, right? It's 10 to 20 now. They ain't ain't horrible. It's not horrible. So they go on. And then... I mean, we're talking not even a minute later. Shab throws this crazy pass, pick six. Wait, 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 17 to 20. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I misspoke earlier. It was, uh, it was yeah, yeah, I, I, it was 17 to 20. And I was just sitting there like, and there was a lot of time left. There was a lot of time left. And one of the announcers said the Seattle Seahawks believe that they can win every game until no matter what the score is until the final whistle. And that was it. And though many of you are going, what? What are you talking about? How is that? How is that to be successful? How many times in your life have you been 20 and 3? Bills are late. Relationships not going well. There's so many things that are pressing on you. Weighing heavy on your soul that you check out. You cop out. You tap out. And I, I looked at this game. And they Seattle Seahawks, I, it was ugly. They were playing horrible. And they never ever tapped out they never freaking gave up ever they still believed no matter what the the score reflected they still believed and I sat back there after I watched the game because it was like this shouldn't have happened and I started to think I started to really really think Many people are looking for some simple, easy, 
portable strategy that they could put in their pocket and whip out as needed to be successful. Successful is not a thing. It's a verb. It's not an end goal. It's an ongoing journey. You cannot put success in your pocket. It's too big for that. That's why it takes a lifetime to be successful. So you look at this this thing, and I, I remember there's been many times that I was 20 and 3, and I didn't give up. Sometimes I was absolutely stunned at the results by simply showing up when all variables, all elements of the situation dictated that I should just stay at home. I went out to get some units. This was the first year in the storage auction business. It was December. Really didn't know about it. A guy by the name of Dave Spivey was telling us about tax season coming. You won't be able to buy anything decent for about three months. I took that information to heart. So I went out. And in December, on the storage auction trail, with hardly any money, 35, 40 bucks, something like that. We had all kinds of stuff, overspent, made some poor decisions, but I had the growth mindset. If you're not growing, you're dying. So I went out to the auctions with just a slim wallet. And what I found out was that in December, many people don't show up. First auction, there was two of us, 10 units. I got everything I wanted for a dollar, which was six. I could have got the other ones, but I didn't want them. I got those units that normally would have been $200, $300 units if there had been a crowd for a dollar a piece. And also, since the day was going so well, I'd said, hey, you know, could you give me to the end of the year to clean it out? Sure. Our census is low. During the winter, we don't rent out a lot of storage foot lockers. I took that information, I put it in my pocket, and I took it to the next place. Same deal. There was four people. Since the money in my pocket was dwindling, <laughs> I started going for bigger units. I was getting 10 by 20s, 10 by 30s for a dollar. And I said to the storage facility manager, could I get to the end of the month or possibly even January? Sure. I go on that whole day and the, the scene repeats itself over and over again. After I ran out of money, I started getting units free by asking for them. So this is a time when I didn't have any real financial firepower. I mean, what I had in my pocket was basically enough to cover lunch or dinner. And I was able to get damn near 20 really awesome units for that because I showed up. A lot of people in the storage auction business, their sales go down after Thanksgiving. You know, people aren't going to the flea market. That's changed. This was back then. This was 2013. Things have totally changed. But back then, uh, people took a hit. They, you know, after Thanksgiving, their sales tanked. And they didn't really go back out until, you know, after, I mean, end of January, beginning of February, waiting on that tax money. I didn't stay at home. I went out and I discovered new things. Because, I, you know, I was 10 and 20. I was 20 and 3. I discovered new things. I discovered all kinds of wonderful information that proved to be useful for several years after the fact. Never did I take a December off. It set the tone for the rest of the year. And there was another time when we had grown bigger. We had employees and understand, you know, my partner and I, we had many battles about this because I was always pushing to grow, pushing to grow, pushing to grow, pushing to grow, grow fast as possible, pushing, pushing. And sometimes 
things pop. Sometimes things break when you're pushing that hard. Well, I miscalculated and spent all the money. And it was four days before uh, payday. I didn't have any cash. My credit lines personal were tapped. I had started working on business credit. So I had my LLC. I went to the bank. And my score, which was not what I thought it should be. I think it was like 650, 660 at the time. I went to the bank and was able to get a $25,000 line of credit. I said, oh, this is interesting. I went to another bank. And I went to another bank. And I went to another bank. All on the same day. At the end of that day, I had $100,000 in open lines of credit from four different banks. I didn't tap out. I didn't stop. What I'm trying to tell you is the very thing that you are running from, hardship, putting yourself in a stressful position, is the very thing that will give you success because it will force you to think about doing something in a different manner. If the level of thought that you currently possess in employing your everyday life was enough for you to get the things that you want out of life, be that your own business, be it that house on the lake, the woman or man of your dreams, if that thought process, if those abilities, the way that you currently think was enough to get you those things, you would have them now. The simple fact that you don't have them now means that the way that you think now is not enough. And it'll never be enough. Each time that I was 20 and 3 and I didn't tap out and I kept pushing, there was always a favorable result. Because it's like that cartoon you see all of the time. There's these two guys... And they're underground and they're digging. One guy's real close to the diamonds. The other guy just gave up. He has this pick over his shoulder and he's walking away. During these times of crisis, these times when you're 20 and 3, these times when things are just falling apart, you are so close to where you want to be, but because you (laughs) tap out, because you mentally can't deal with the stress, You don't yield the results that you want. That's it. Do not ever give up. Don't ever tap out. There are many people, their tap out threshold is pathetically low. It's raining outside. I'm not going to go for that run. That's extremely low tap out. Whoa, there's too much traffic. I'm not going to go on that trip. Many of us who are American citizens have become so fucking soft and lazy that the tap out threshold is so low that sometimes you tap out because you look out and the sun is shining and you don't feel like entertaining the brightness that day that you pull the covers over your head and roll over in your bed and just stay there. This is how you become successful. Raising your tap out level. Taking your abilities as far as you can and then when you crash or when you wreck Or when you fall down or when you skin your knees or when you bust your head, you get up and ask yourself, how much further can I go? Because, see, when you get to that point, it, it is so hard to describe how many times that I wanted to tap out. And understand, wanting to tap out and tapping out are two different things. That day... Well, I was like, how am I going to pay these people? How am I going to pay these people? These people got to be paid. They, they did the work. They deserve to be paid. They earned their money. I got to get them their money. So 
payroll was only <laughs> it was only like three thousand dollars. But when I got that new information about that, hey, with a score of 660, banks will extend you lines of credit of 25,000, I went out and got as many as I could. I actually went to a fifth bank, and the fifth bank said, no, you have too many inquiries. Okay, you caught me. If I did not put myself in that position, I would have not had that knowledge to know that banks would do that on such a low credit score. I was amazed. I was totally amazed. And we got to the point where, you know, I told my partner, my partner was like, really? My partner's credit score was higher than mine. She went out and did the same thing and got the same lines. So here we were, couldn't sleep, worried how we're going to pay these people three days out from payday and within eight hours. We have $200,000 worth of operating capital because we didn't tap out. See, the storage auction business leads you to operate on a cash-only business, which is very good in some aspects and very dangerous in others. As long as the cash is coming, you don't suffer any lulls, you're good to go. But the minute you suffer a lull or you have a bunch of stuff that's not selling, the bills don't stop ticking. The rent has to be paid. Fuel still has to go in the vehicles. And if you have employees, they have to get their paychecks. As promised. So here was this moment of calamity, crisis. It was cataclysmic. Eight hours. We were grinning. And I went out to dinner that night and blew like 300 bucks at some fancy restaurant. Because I couldn't believe how simple it was. See, the big deal is about being successful isn't what happens to you. It's how you deal with it. Maintaining a level of calmness and the ability to think under pressure. That's how you become successful. It's not some special program. It's not some cookie cutter method because everyone in life is walking on their own path. The life that you lead is so different than the life that your neighbor leads. You may live in the same neighborhood. You may live in similar houses. You may have a similar income level and then the differences just start to mount. People are looking for the easy way out. And when they cannot find the easy way, then the people who are successful, all of these animations of schemes, of unfairness, of special perks start to fill their minds. Well, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Networking is important, but I submit to you that innovation, the ability to think on your fit, feet, the ability to create stuff is more important. It is more important. We live in an age, this year of our Lord, 2013, that you can go into your spare bedroom, get on YouTube, leverage the knowledge that you gain on YouTube, the internet. Your only cost is sweat equity. And you could, within a year, be having... A part-time business making 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 grand or more. The information is out there. The resources are out there. Why aren't more people successful? It's a mindset. Going back to the Seattle Seahawks. They did not stop believing, no matter how ugly it got. If you saw J.J. Watt, he got his ass kicked. J.J. Watt was kicking ass for three quarters. I mean, he was he got punched, literally. Six, six, seven stitches. I mean, you have to think about the mental resiliency that the Houston Texans are going to have to employ to get over this one. Because, see, the thing is, and this is something I have tried to teach some of my friends. 
when you have somebody 20 and 3, you need to put another two scores on the on the board to just crush their spirits. At 20 and 3, 17 points, the Seattle Seahawks were going, well, two touchdowns in the field goal. Hey, we've got 20 minutes. We've done this before. And they did it because they believed there were people in that stadium that were absolutely stunned. It's one thing to come down from one touchdown in that time, or, you know, 10 points. They were down 17 points and couldn't move the ball for the majority of the game. Someone was like, well, Brian Cushing got hurt and that changed the game. I say one player leaves and that changes the game. Well, here's some more information for you. The Seattle Seahawks had six starters that didn't play. So, yeah, the Houston Texans lost one guy. The Seattle Seahawks hadn't, didn't have six starters available from jump. So, I call bullshit on that. Because... When Russell Wilson started rolling and his receivers were like, okay, we need to come back. They kept playing. They kept playing. No matter. It's like the Oregon Ducks. When you watch them and they run up against a team with a defense in the first few quarters, they don't score all those points. But they stick to their script. We're the Oregon Ducks. What we do is create high level, insane levels of offense. And they keep coming. And they keep coming. And they keep coming. Tennessee this year held them for a minute. Then psh, it was over. You have to understand. If you do not stop, you will be successful on some level. If you do not stop. But that tap out level, that. You know life, you kick my ass, I can't take it no more. I'm about to go take this one and go sit in the corner, go in the locker room, put a little salve, maybe sit in the hot tub, and think about how you kicked my ass yet once again. Successful people say, fuck the hot tub. I'm bleeding, I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to, hey, you know what, you're going to get some of this blood on you. I am not going to stop. I am not going to go ahead and submit to life saying you can't have this. When I wrote my first book, The How-To Guide, because it had a different name, that I don't even remember at the moment, there was so many problems with that book. And there were so many people that were like, oh, Glendon Cameron get right. Glendon Cameron put up this messed, out, messed up product. Glendon Cameron did this. There was so much stuff that was coming from people. One person who was one of the most vocal people wrote a book of his own that's on Amazon right now. I'm not going to give you his name because I'm not trying to give him any business. But he has not sold as many, because I've checked and I know how the Amazon ranking system works. He has not sold as many books since he put that book out, maybe a year ago, as I used to sell in a day. Hold on. <laughs> that felt good. Now understand, you have to understand how the world works. You have to understand that if you keep pushing, you don't tap out. Many people are not used to dealing with that. If you are one of those hard charging business persons and you just keep pushing, a lot of times you get a rep for being just tough to deal with because most people are not used to someone that is relentless. They're not used to that tenacity. They're just not, it's just like, it's too much because they cannot relate. In the 48 laws of power, there's this one law. Don't piss off the wrong person. There are people that you piss them off they are coming after you. I don't care if you're in the castle. I don't care if you're in the fortress of solitude. They are going to come after you and they will not stop until the breath leaves their body. That is a scary motherfucker. 
And many people are worried about the scary motherfucker versus mentally flipping it and saying, I am going to become the scary motherfucker. That little switch, that little 180 degree turn of I'm afraid versus I am. When you become that person, you will get so many results, but it goes back to mental resiliency. You have to have the ability of Peyton Manning because everyone right now is looking at him and going, woo. When Peyton first came out, he was garbage. He threw so many interceptions, but he didn't tap out. Did you hear me? He didn't. He didn't tap out. He kept playing. He kept playing. He kept playing. He got better. He learned to read defenses better. He kept playing. He kept playing. Even when his neck was jacked up and he got traded, he said, fuck it. I'm Peyton fucking man, and I'm going to keep playing. And right now, he's that scary motherfucker. Because he did not quit through the pain, through the adversity. And understand, this dude is going into the Hall of Fame. He already has won a Super Bowl ring. He does have nothing else to prove. But he didn't tap out. He took his game to an upper level. I want you to think about that. Mental resiliency is not just not tapping out. It's also not becoming comfortable with your success. He has it all. He's got more money than you or I, all of us put together. But he's still out there competing at an extremely high level because he's mentally tough. When you become mentally tough, You can literally change your world. As long as you're tapping out at the slightest hardship, at the rainiest day. I have a neighbor that looks at me weird because if I have a walking schedule and if it's raining, I grab my umbrella and I still go out. Rain does not stop me. I've been like that for years. And there are many people, no, it's raining. I'm not going out there. Why? It's water. There's actually fewer people out there. I do my thing. Rain or shine. You have to become that person. That is how you become successful in life. There's all these things that you know you need energy and enthusiasm. You need passion. You need drive. Without mental toughness and courage, you're not going to get too far with those things. It's not going to happen. You can have all of the tools in the world, money, time, personal resources, relationships, connections. But the minute it gets rough and you want to tap out, so what? Going back to Russell Wilson, who was the deal of a deal for quarterbacks, he wasn't a first round draft pick. He had to earn that position, which means the CL Seahawks got a deal of a lifetime. If he continues on, and I do believe that he will, this dude's going in the Hall of Fame, and he will get some Super Bowls. Understand, that organization, that culture that Pete Carroll has built is a different one than it used to be. They believe they can win. No matter what. They used to be my Pittsburgh Steelers. Right now, they're going through all types of issues. And it'll work itself out. Because the culture, the history of that team, is just like the University of Alabama. When you look at these programs that have history of winning, it's because of a philosophy. There is someone... He used to be Mal, but he passed. Someone at the top is saying, we are going to win. Someone's going to, someone at the top is like, we're going to make whatever personal financial investments that we need to make to win. Schools that don't do that well, 
they treat it as just a byproduct of you know college life. I will say, for many schools, football is number one over educating students, which could be one of the reasons that you know the degree myth video I made not a few years ago is so relevant. But you have to make the decision to be successful. You cannot use namby pamby wimpy words such as "I hope to be successful." Well, we'll see what works out. Uh, well, I tried my best and it didn't work out, so I guess that's just not for me. That is pussy talk. It is pussy talk. And when you speak pussy talk to yourself, you fuck yourself. You mentally condition yourself for mediocrity. You mentally condition yourself to tap out so quick, so easy, so fast that you walk around mad at yourself because there's so many times that you could have been successful if you had just went an inch further, not a mile, not 10 miles, an inch because your tap out threshold is so low. It doesn't take anything. Someone can sneeze. You're tapping out. You can't deal with that because it's so low. Someone asked me on Facebook, it's like, how did you become so resilient? And I said, from a lot of fucking up. And when I go back, it started early. I had to learn how to speak, something that most people take for granted. You know, six years of speech pathology in there, flipping flashcards and pronouncing words until my jaw hurt. I didn't know that what I thought was an unfairness was an advantage. At a very early age, I learned how to work harder than most people. That is a serious, wonderful attribute to have. The ability to learn how to outwork a lot of people, which is the reason that my first book, which was not the best, I will not shy away from that. I won't run from it. I'm actually proud of it because there are people out there that have spent 10 years writing the perfect book, getting it perfectly edited, doing all of these wonderful things, and they sold 100 copies. <laughs> and I know a person like that who can't stand my ass because I rub it in all the time. Understand, mindset is so important. Mindset is incredibly important in being successful. The more resilient you are, the more abilities you will develop. Because see, this is the thing that many people get really, really wrong. I had to develop so many things that I did not have. See, the right mindset says, well, you know, I don't have money. All right, I'm going to develop things or skill sets or create opportunities where I can get the money. The wimpy mindset is, well, that's too hard. With the right mindset, you will learn how to get the things that you need. You will learn how to build. You'll learn how to connect with people because you are pushing forward. You are not <laughs> tapping the fuck out. I've seen so many people tap out on some of the silliest stuff. And this is another form of tapping out, what I call the information gatherer. The person that has all kinds of bookmarks on their computer. They have all kinds of cutouts and clips and folders with all of this information. And they've collected this information for years and haven't done a damn thing with it. That's a form of tapping out. It's the busy tap out. Well, I'm still gathering information. I'm still doing research. I'm still putting this together for a decade. In that movie, Collateral, with Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx. And Jamie shows Tom, the hitman, that he wants to start this limo service. And Jamie, Jamie gets called out by Tom. He's like, you were never going to do it in the first place. What is the lease on the limo? Four twenty-five a month. I want you to think about this. How many times have you seen someone come from another country? They cannot speak the language. They know they can't get a job. 
They don't have a social security number. They don't have a credit profile, but they have the might mindset. That's like, well, no one's going to hire me. So I'm going to create my own job. Think about that. By being in a situation where they have to perform, they do perform. No one's going to hire them. They don't speak the language. So they do what they can with what they have and they create their own businesses. I cannot tell you how many times I have watched a Mexican family that would come into my warehouse and I will see them. Because the thing is, when you give Mexicans good deals, they come back over and over and they bring friends and they bring family and they tell everyone. And I remember this one guy that came in, talked to him. His English was better than most. Next thing I know, he had this van. Next thing I know, he's driving this Ford F-150. Two years after that, he's got a Ford F-250. That's a $50,000 truck at the time. That was a $50,000 truck, the uh, 250. Then he got the 350 dually, and I was talking to him. And this guy, who had... But who who probably had only been in the United States four or five months, I mean, sorry, four or five years at that time, went from nothing to he started a mason because he was a mason in Mexico. He knew how to do designs and lay bricks and put, you know, and pour cement. That's what he knew how to do. So he came here with those skills and created a business that allowed him, now understand, he didn't have any credit, he had to pay cash for that truck. Do you understand me? He had a masonry business. And I could tell by the way that his wife was dressing, the way the kids were dressing, he was doing better and better because they were looking nicer and nicer. And his wife, she was hot. I ain't going to lie. She was hot. He did that. And the same time that the average person takes to get a degree because he had the right mindset. He wasn't afraid of hard work. He didn't tap out. That's one of the things that I like about the immigrants. There are so many people like, oh, the immigrants are coming to America and they're just weighing down the systems. If it wasn't for immigrants, there wouldn't be a fucking America. The name America, it comes from it. It's an Italy. It comes from it comes from Italy. The name American is Italian. That's why when I hear people say ignorant stuff, I say to myself, you are one uneducated person and you have not been anywhere. Because if you knew what you were talking about, you wouldn't say such ignorant things. But this is to let you know, if you push that extra inch, how well off you could be. Because so many people are looking for the easy way out. I want to ask you a question. The last time that you were dealing with something so powerful, so horrible, so overwhelming, what did you do? Did you stand up or did you shrink it in the corner like a little coward? What did you do? What did you do? The answer isn't for me. It's for you. Because when you learn to not tap out, when you learn to keep pushing you increase your mental toughness. This is not some inflexible attribute in your psyche. This is something that you can build on. Because early in my life, I tapped out. When I was 11, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had people like, no, don't do it. I tapped out because, you know, I just tapped out. If I had the mental strength now that I have now, then I wouldn't have tapped out. But just to let you know, it can be developed. So if you don't have it now, there's no reason to go, oh, well, it's too late. No, it's not too late. You can start working on that today. You can start challenging yourself right now to do things that you've never done before to push yourself to a higher level. To be successful in any part of the world, you got to know what you want. So many people, it's like, uh, huh? They don't know what they want. They have not sat down and framed up what they want in life. There's no framework. There's no real strong image of what they want. 
They they haven't had the gall to say, I want to make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. I want to make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. I want to make three hundred thousand. They haven't they haven't asked themselves those questions. They say stuff like, as long as they have enough money to get the bills paid, I'm happy. In our current world of flux, in our current world of disruption, that type of thinking is damn near suicidal. You may have a great job that pays the bills and gives you a little extra. That job may be gone in five years. What are you going to do then? It is not a crime to push in the want for more than what you have. It's not a sin. God will not look down upon you and shake his head. I live in a universe of abundance. There is so much abundance. There's so much money. There's so much love. There's so much, there's so much of everything out there. When you have the abundant mindset and know that you can get more, it's a totally different world. Totally different world. So I want you to understand that to be successful is as simple as not quitting when the going gets rough. All right. This is Glendon Cameron with another episode of the American Hustler podcast. If you want to really up your hustle, increase your mental acuity, join my Hustler University group on Facebook. Hit this green bar and you'll be golden. All right, this is Glendon. I'll see you on the good side.